my name is Judd Gaddy, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Transpec. Um, thank you, everyone here tonight for coming. Uh, really great that you guys could all make it. Um, it's been a while since uh, uh, many of us have been out for a big talk, so this is great. Um, uh, firstly, um, uh, you know, uh, Tr Transpec has benefited hugely um, over the years from working with uh, Martin Thompson in Real Logic. Um, the Aeron code base is a masterpiece of engineering. We've, uh, you know, made great use of it and learned a lot from it and, and from Martin himself and his colleagues at Real Logic. So it's really great that we have him here tonight to give us a talk. Um, if you really want to thank Martin for coming out tonight, then buy a support contract for Real Logic. <laughs> it's, thank uh, you. <laughs> it's, it's open source, but uh, you know it's a lot of hard work. Martin and his team puts their uh, lifeblood into uh, Aeron, so yeah, it'll be really great if you know we can uh, return that in some way. So yeah, go and you know, talk to who you need to talk to, um, and uh, and then obviously uh, Transfic, we're hiring, we're growing. So if any of you guys want to come work at a exciting startup which is you know not as much of a startup as it was quite a few years back so then uh, you know we're hiring please uh, you know drop us an email I'm sure you'll know how to contact us anyway on that note uh, thank you very much and over to Martin thank you Judd yeah, nice intro. Didn't expect the plug straight away, which is really useful. <laughs> well, it is finance, and you use open source software all the time, but you don't pay for it. The two largest users of open source software are banking and pornography, and <laughs> neither pay for it. <laughs> but you kind of benefit from it. So what I want to talk here today about is this is a talk I wrote two years ago, and I only give it once. And straight after I give it, we went into the first lockdown. So this is kind of really odd for me. This is my first talk in maybe two years. I'm sure it's odd for most people coming out. But I want to revisit some of what has happened over the last decade in financial exchanges. I've got to see a number of them. And I want to cover a bit of this and sort of let you know what I've seen as changes in this space. So we're going to go through a little bit of it. Because 10 plus years ago, it was almost 10 years exactly when the last time I gave this talk, since I first talked about the Disruptor and LMAX and various other things with Dave Farley. We did it at one of the QCons in 2010. And it's like the world has changed so much in that time. And it was kind of really interesting coming out and speaking about financial systems and how we developed them. Because I noticed at the time, no one was talking publicly about what was done. And hopefully we changed a little bit of that. And it was kind of really nice at LMAX, the fact that we did talk about some of what we did publicly, because it, it helped make people be aware of us. It was also brilliant for recruitment when you could see that we actually did some pretty cool things. But a lot has changed in the last 10 years, and I want to kind of cover a bit of that. And I'm going to talk about four areas tonight. I want to talk about how design has gone over the time, specifically a little bit about what's interesting in the exchange space when we look at this. How resilience has changed in that time period. And I think this has been one of the most fundamental changes that I have seen. Where we've gone with performance and how we're now looking at deploying our systems. Because this has all been evolving a little bit gradually to begin with, but the rate at which things have been evolving, I've noticed, has really been picking up. And during the last year or so, through the pandemic, I've seen more change than I have in 30 years, nearly in this industry, that have been before. Things have really accelerated, and people have used this time period of when the world has changed to go back, revisit, and look at new ways of doing stuff. And this is kind of common through history. Often, the people who are most successful are the ones who use opportunities to evolve and move forward because there's usually big step changes around big changes in industry, the world in general. So on design, what's really stood out over some of this time period? Well, if you build something like a financial exchange, you're effectively building state machines. 
And there's various types of state machines, melee and more. I'm going to talk about the melee style state machines because this is what really fits into the space I get to see a lot. And what we're doing is we have inputs to a system. We process those inputs over a given state and that results in a new state in the system. So an event happens, you deal with that event, you transform from one state to another. This is the sort of thing that tends to happen. And the inputs applied to a state will also result in a given output from that system. And we get to see this as a way of building systems. And it's actually quite a formally well understood thing that's been around for a long time. We often don't realize that if you write a program, you're effectively writing a state machine whether you know it or not. Just how effectively you do it and how well you model the states helps with the reasoning and dealing with a lot of this. But What's particularly interesting is if we look at how these are replicated. So in a typical replicated state machine, we have a set of ordered inputs. They're applied to a given state, and if the application of those inputs as transforms is applied in a deterministic fashion, we can result in the same resulting state and the same set of outputs. This is fundamentally where replicated state machines come from where we can do this on multiple machines and it's a really interesting way to get resilience in a system by following these simple rules. Now this approach has been around for a long time. I'm going to cover a little bit of the history of some of this. So it's well understood, well researched, been around a long time. You'll also hear of things like event sourcing and various other approaches. These are a bit more mushy. They're not really as formally understood and they rely a lot on programmer discretion. And we all know, as programmers, we make far too many mistakes. And to have a system based upon that sort of approach ends up being very non-deterministic and quite broken in its approach to doom and stuff. So imagine if we have these systems whereby we quite strictly follow the rules, we can have some really interesting properties. Now, to do this in a distributed way, to have truly replicated state machines, we need to have a log of all of those inputs. Those inputs must all be gathered together and they must be replicated to other machines and then applied to the state machines in those other machines. By doing that, we can end up getting the system to reach the same eventual state. And this way, we have that, the ability to tolerate faults and go forward on this. And so a distributed log becomes the core of this. How do we achieve a distributed log? This is where things get quite interesting. Now, once we have this distributed log, we can then apply those events to a system. Now, many of us, I'm sure, have programmed with databases and ORMs and all sorts of complex systems like that is, you end up with a, a domain model that can be quite anemic. We're often restricted by what the underlying data store can do. But if the domain model can be just hosted in memory and it doesn't need to be stored in a database or some other sort of storage system, it's much richer in how it can be represented. You've got the full flexibility of any given language and you end up with these nice models to work on. And so things like exchanges, risk systems, surveillance systems, all the things in this space end up to be very nice rich domain models and so domain driven design fits very nicely with these sorts of approaches. And so the DDD side stands out. But as these get ever more complex and interesting, they're also great from a computer science perspective because we've got to represent the relationships between the entities in this domain by relationships. And those relationships need to have data structures to back them up. The data structures, again, becomes a really interesting problem space. And the data structures, you could be choosing them, so getting to know about all of them, or you can even be developing them. Now, if you're building some of the best financial exchanges in the world, you're often building custom data structures to represent the relationships between those entities. So, for example, if you've got order books inside an exchange and you've got orders on those for given customers that are going to match, how you represent those relationships for the time orders and priorities and fit in with complex order types for fills and kills and even related orders that are fungible in different ways. It's a really fascinating problem from a data structure perspective. So the people who 
really specialized in this area are effectively data structure specialists. And they get to build these data structures and cool things that's in this space. And what we start seeing over time is that area becomes specialized, focused on, and really advances at a really interesting level. And I've got to see this happening over time. So like, on one level, I get to help customers. And some of those customers are building reasonably interesting applications, but they run into performance issues and reliability issues. And they start looking at the data structures, and they've just picked data structures that are inappropriate for the usages. They don't get to see firsthand why that is, because they often don't have the, the right load, especially the load in testing. If you work on a financial exchange, especially one of the higher volume ones, you get to see this thing first class all of the time, otherwise things don't perform well. So you need to look at data structures that are order one or log n in their nature, rather than just being very linear in its approaches. You have to pick the right data structures for doing this, and you get to build all of these interesting data structures. Time is also an interesting problem in this space. So, Let's say I place an order into a market, and if it doesn't fill within a given period of time, it should be canceled. So it's got a good till uh, field on it. How do we cancel that and deal with it in an interesting way? Because these state machines, they can only do a state transition based upon inputs. They can't go out and read the system clock. If they do, they're not deterministic across the machines. So what you often end up doing is pulsing time into the system, and then you've got a resolution problem. So let's say you want to have microsecond precision and resolution in your system. You need to pulse in a million events a second to do that, and these have been distributed, and you have to record all of those. So that becomes a problem in its own right. So how do we deal with that? It's better it becomes part of the infrastructure itself and we move forward based on this. So it's kind of showing that there's a lot of interesting and complex issues just in the domain model and how we deal with this and how we move forward. And I've been sort of dealing with a whole range of these problems now for a few decades. And kind of sort of going back through time and looking at what's been built, what's available, what's not available, and how we do this. And the last few years particularly, I've seen this whole explosion of new exchanges being developed, particularly in the crypto space. Because it seems like everybody and their dog is developing a new crypto trading platform. And we need to deal with these. And some of the mistakes in it are just mind-boggling when you get to see them. Like I've been keeping track of some of the worst latency profiles I've got to see. Like if you're looking at some of the best exchanges that are out there at the moment, and we're talking about like some of the best equity exchanges, you're measuring in tens of microseconds from an order arriving to seeing an execution report come out and being really consistent in that space. If you look at some of the crypto exchanges, the record I have seen is 40 minutes <laughs> from order to response. <laughs> and they do crazy stuff with XML and JSON and Redis and Django and databases. And it seems to be a competition to see how much technology you can put into an exchange. And exchange is really all about less is more. You really want to keep things simple and elegant and clean. And they're kind of going through this evolution of opening up, doing quite well and getting traction, and then realizing their designs don't work, and then go back and revisit and do it all again. I, I get to see these a, a lot, and I'll, I'll talk through some of the examples a little bit later. So it's a kind of fascinating space. And we don't learn very well as an industry from a lot of what's gone in the past. Like the physics, we talk about building on the shoulders of giants. I think in computer science, we just forget our history. And every generation, every group that goes through just reinvents the wheel. And I keep finding people sort of discovering stuff. Look at this really cool stuff that we came up with. Nah, games programming done that in the 1980s and stuff. And the, the, these sort of things are really common in what we get to see. But, one of the biggest changes I have seen in the last 10 years is this whole view on fairness. The markets have changed quite radically in that it used to be quite unfair. And a lot of the banks kind of did things their own ways and got away with it. But now they've got competition and we've got regulators who want things to be different. And even customers pushing for things to be different in this space. And it makes a huge difference and to be transparent with this. So I'll give you some 
quite simple examples where just people will abuse the systems and do that. And I'll show you a picture in a second of how things are typically done in this space and why it's changing. But fundamentally, a move towards fairness is becoming a much more common thing. And like, here's a simple example of this. Like, 10 years ago, a typical exchange will have looked something like this. We'll have typically two matching engines in a system. There may be more being sharded, but just for simplicity, typically you get two matching engines. One's your primary and one's a backup in case the primary has died. You then have multiple gateways facing off to customers. And a classic problem you see, and I've worked in gaming, gambling, and finance over a lot of my career, and I've seen the same problems happen across them all. So a classic thing that will happen is you'll get a customer out there and then some client of this system will connect to a gateway. They'll connect to multiple gateways to an exchange and send in orders and measure the response and work out which of the gateways is giving me the best response time to do that. That all seems reasonable. That seems a fair thing to do. Being aware of these issues, you go through and you connect and you find the most efficient path for you to put an order in, so you're gonna trade at your lowest latency. Now, what if you're not such a nice person and you decide, do you know what, I've worked out the fastest gateway. Now, what if I stuff a load of orders through those other gateways that are off market price and won't match and I'll clog up those other systems? And by doing that, you're now disadvantaging everybody else. This is a very common thing that many went into doing well, there's actually a really quite simple solution to this and where a lot of the exchanges have started moving towards, and that is to have only one gateway that everybody comes through. By only going into a single gateway, you can start to play some of those games. But everything that you do has consequences. So if we design an exchange that has only got a single gateway, we've solved a lot of the fairness problems and as a result, we actually drop the traffic levels quite a lot because if a lot of the misbehavior goes away, that can cause a significant reduction in traffic that's coming to the system, but it's still quite a high level of traffic. We've now got an interesting performance problem. So the people who work on these gateways can't just go wide and throw more gateways at the problem. You've got to get good at developing individual gateways and making them high performance. And so, for example, if this was a fixed gateway, if you're going to use something like Quick Fix, which is the most terrible name ever for any product because <laughs> it sure as hell is not quick, it doesn't work. You need to have a better way of doing that. So you moved either to binary protocols or to at least a really good implementation of Fix that you can send all of your traffic through a single node. And that becomes a relatively simple way of solving that problem, but your developers have to be good at writing efficient code. Now, we can scale this a little bit. So one of the things that the regulators will allow us to do is we can have different groups of customers put into classifications. And as long as we treat everyone fairly within the same classification, that's fine from a grouping perspective. And we can have different classifications treated differently. So for example, if you've got a group of market makers, they can be treated in one way. If you've got a, a group of professional traders coming in through APIs, they can be treated in one way. You've got a group of people coming across the internet through web browsers, they can be treated in a different way as well, but they can all be distinct as long as you're fair within the given classification. Because let's face it, if somebody's trading through a web browser, they're not doing low latency arbitrage unless they're very good at typing. Although we have actually seen some systems where we were surprised that we thought was an automated robot doing some of the trading that actually turned out to be a human. And some of these humans used to play things like uh, StarCraft and various games, and they got really good with keyboards. In fact, one of the best uh, FX traders I ever seen in the first place was a Japanese woman who could type with two hands at one time on separate keyboards. And she was taking orders from one system, putting into another system separately <laughs> and simultaneously. It was impressive to see. <laughs> really interesting orb opportunities happening through doing that, just through humans with amazing sort of physical dexterity. She pointed out she was an amazing pianist as well, so it's just something that was natural to her. But so we get this where we can go through the different groups, and that's 
less just a little bit of scalability, but we're still dealing with it in that way. But even the matching engines themselves can be scaled by sharding, maybe by order books or asset classes and various other things. So we can get a little bit of, thing, of scalability by doing this, but it's limited in what we do. So we still have to really get performance right to work on this. And we're also seeing just a lot of migration. So if I go back 10 plus years ago, a lot of stuff for this OTC is now going on to exchange. And so this is all about the move of fairness and transparency. So we're getting to see this happen more and more. And you see it through the different asset classes, like equities were the first to really get fast and clean in how they work. And it's the move through FX, fixed income, various other spaces and crypto as we're kind of moving forward. And you see the same problems being invented over and over again and people learning from it as they go. But also getting people to give up things like last look seems to be an interesting challenge in some of these spaces. Now, resilience. This is something I find absolutely fascinating over the time and the approach that people take to this. So, um, what do I mean by this? Like, resilience is like, how can you respond when something goes wrong, particularly when you have a fault in a system? So, if we have a fault in the system, can we tolerate it and continue processing? and the different ways we have of dealing with this. Now, typically what you get to see is the sort of primary, secondary style approaches and the issues that come with this. So I go back to 10 plus years ago, virtually everybody I seen was running a primary, secondary approach. Like a main one with a hot backup running beside it. Now this is actually fundamentally flawed at so many levels. So if you've got a primary system running and it fails, you then need to bring the backup online to use it. it all seems simple enough. We kind of agree that it's a reasonable approach. Well, once you've lost your primary and you're now running on your secondary, what if your secondary dies? Try having that as a discussion with a lawyer when they're trying to defend a customer at that point. So you're taking orders, particularly from a retail customer, and you have no backup. How do we deal with repudiation? So technically, it's an interesting problem. Legally, it's a way more interesting problem. You cannot be running primary, secondary, and in the case of failure, continuing. I would say the only argument for running primary, secondary is if someone has built up a position, and you get a failure of the primary system, you use the secondary just to let them trade out and go flat. Because you do want to continue going on and then building up a position that they're not able to trade out of. And particularly in the retail space, it's very unfair on customers to work that way. So we need to be working and thinking in a different way. And it gets even more complex than that. What if the connection between your primary and your secondary has failed and we now have a split brain concept in the network. Which one should be the primary? Which should be serving traffic? Now, typically when these sorts of things happen, someone will be woken up at two o'clock in the morning to deal with this, and I've been that person in the past, and you end up making horrendous mistakes because you're tired. You haven't had your coffee. For me, I just really don't function without my coffee. So, I need to get in and sort of work out how to deal with this. You want it to be much better than that. And the real solution to this is using consensus. So for example, if you're running three nodes, you reach consensus of what data has been stored on a majority of members within the cluster you know, that's there. And then in the case of failure, you elect a new node which has got the most up-to-date state that can continue processing. And if you failed with a single node in that case, you can still continue because you have another backup that can keep going. And if you were to lose a second node, then you're into a different case. But again, a simple three node cluster, you can lose one member and continue going, and it can work well at that stage. That's an easier discussion to have with a lawyer. It's also much easier at two o'clock in the morning, whenever the system fails, and there's an automatic election happens in the system to appoint the new member, especially if we've got a split brain scenario, which node should become the leader and how we continue on. Because if one of the nodes gets disconnected from the other two, the two that are remaining can communicate with each other, elect a leader among them, and keep processing. 
The other one will not be causing any problems because it's not got a majority of the cluster, so it doesn't have quorum, and this just works. Uh, one of my clients had this as a real example a couple of years ago, and this was brilliant to see it happen. So they happened to be a 24-7 running exchange. They were in an asset class I won't mention, but they're running 24-7, and at 4.30 in the morning, one of their nodes died. People came into work the next day, and there was no call out during the night because another node was automatically elected and the system continued processing and they just had an event in the morning to say they lost a node in the middle of the night. It's kind of a really nice place to be rather than somebody having to get out of bed and try and work out how to deal with that and cope with it. So it becomes a much better way of dealing with these sorts of things. Now things like telco systems and others have been doing this for a long time and it works really well. They may be running five node clusters, seven node clusters depending on what they're doing. So consensus is a much better way of dealing with this. And this work is not new. Go right back to 1984 and Leslie Lamport wrote a paper on time versus timeout where he seeded a lot of ideas to start solving this problem. First one to solve the problem was Barbara Liskoff with Vstamp Replication, very closely followed by Leslie Lamport himself with Paxos and then Ken Berman was doing uh, work around the same time. So this is kind of common. You get a lot of simultaneous discovery with people who aren't even working together because the problem needs to be solved. But this was solved in the 1980s. We've had consensus-based systems. Why are people in finance still doing primary, secondary systems? I see this all of the time. And one of the conclusions I've come to is the IT departments are so poor in getting hardware and systems out to people that they try to run with the minimum of what they're working with. Like, who's trying to get a test server and it's taken six to nine months to get it? Like, I think we all kind of know this. This world is changing. A lot of people are moving to cloud, and I'll talk about that later, because it becomes so much easier to do this. And having the ability to get access to more hardware totally changes the whole space around this. So solve problem a couple of decades ago, but it's a hard problem. Huh. I've implemented some of these protocols before, and things like Paxos is notoriously difficult to understand and get right. And then this paper came out in 2014 the RAF paper. And the whole idea behind this was how do we design a consensus-based system that's easy to understand? This was the primary goal. The primary goal was not consensus. The primary goal was how do we design one that's easy to understand? And the paper itself was so easy to read, most people moved ahead and dealt with this. And this, I think, changed the whole space here which people started to realize consensus is reachable by mere mortals. The kind of twist to this is it's actually not that easy. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. But it made it possible for people to sort of grok the ideas and start to work with it and move forward quite a lot. And now we're starting to see Raft as the common way of doing consensus in many systems. There's many other uh, algorithms out there and many evolutions of it. If anybody's interested in the space, follow Heidi Howard's work at Cambridge and she's breaking down lots of the different approaches and the ways of doing this. It's really great work. But if you've got something like Raft, you get all these really nice properties. So you have things like election safety by following the algorithm. So that sort of two or three o'clock in the morning case where a node dies, how do we elect a leader and make sure we get it right? The algorithm has this formally proven to be correct, along with a bunch of other properties that are really very nice. And it makes a lot of the space much easier to deal with. And yet I keep finding over and over again that lots of people keep inventing this and doing it for themselves. In fact, it's actually terrifying that people do it for themselves. Like, if you work with operating systems and you do file systems, the general consensus is you should not trust a file system for at least five to 10 years from this initially being developed because it takes that long to shake out the bugs and get it to be reliable. I've found with consensus-based systems, it's probably in the order of three to five years. So if somebody says that you can knock up a new consensus system in a number of months and base your live system on that, run away. This is a really, really difficult problem. And again, finance is an interesting space for this. We hire lots of really smart people who want to do everything from scratch themselves. 
So how many organizations had a go at building their own and build their own of all of these different things? And there really are poor examples of what's possible. Uh, having built something like Aeron Cluster, I've seen people benchmark Aeron Cluster against their own internal implementations. And they go, oh, we can beat it. We've got it faster. And then we run some real tests on it to see how reliable it is and realize they've only implemented part of the protocol. And the reason they're faster is because they've only done half a job on it and it's not actually reliable. So you've got to be so careful that you're doing the right thing in this space. Now, how does some of this work? Let's, let's make it a bit more concrete. So let's say I've got a three node cluster here and I've got multiple clients connecting to that cluster. And the job of the consensus modules is to reach consensus in the cluster of what we have safely on disk that we can process and go forward with. And so that if we have a failure of up to a minority of the cluster members, we can still go forward without losing any data. And this is the key around consensus and quorum. You can tolerate losing a minority of members. So in the case of a three node cluster, you can tolerate losing one. In a five node cluster, you can tolerate losing two members and still continue safely at that point. If you were to run on less, you have to reconfigure and go forward. So it is possible to have a three node cluster that loses one node, then loses another node. You're not totally stopped, but you have to choose to reconfigure to make it a smaller cluster after that. But at least it becomes a manual step that you're thinking about. So what kind of things happen here? Well, we need to track positions of where things have reached. So I've got a multi-node cluster here, and on the left, I've got a node, it's got a service, and it's storing its log to disk. This distributed log that can use to replay to bring the state machine to the same position. Got another one in the middle and another one on the right. So let's take in the simplest three node cluster that we're dealing with here. And we want to track progress. Now one of the things you'll notice straight away is these numbers are all different. Like if we look at this, like the number here is 25, it's 20 here, it's 21 over here. Wait, what's going on there? Well, there is no such thing as a global state in any distributed system. And that's reality. And this is also a really interesting thing with how people develop systems. Like we develop with synchronous protocols. We develop thinking that we can have a global state. You cannot have global state in anything. Physics gets in the way. We have to accept that there's multiple views of the world and we have to have protocols of interaction to establish consensus on the common view. Like, I have a view of the world just looking around this room and what I see from my inputs. It's a partial view. We all have our own partial views. Now, we could consolidate this to have a common understanding of what's going on, but that requires coordination and how we work. And this is the way you have to start thinking in distributed systems. So, we have multiple views of this world. As we go forward, how do we track what's happening? Well, first thing that's interesting to know is what have we got safely appended to disk that we know we can have a restart of the machine and recover and we can still get that data back again if we were to crash. And so we've got three nodes here having processed various number of messages or positions that they have reached. And the numbers here are arbitrary. There could be message index, there could be byte position, there could be whatever. It just has to be monotonic sequence that only goes forward. Now, the leader in this case, which is sequencing the messages, happens to have appended to number 29. So that's what's going on here in the middle here, 29. Now, over on the left, we have got 25, and on the right, we've got 23. So that lets me know I've got various things on disk. Now, what can I safely go forward and process at any given point in time and knowing that I can tolerate failure? Well, it has to be the maximum position reached by a majority of the cluster members. So in this case, it's actually 25 is what is stored on disk that I know I can safely recover from losing a minority of the cluster. I couldn't go for 29 because I've only got one node has got saved up to 29. 23 is a bit conservative. I can actually go with 25 because I can lose any one of the nodes and still get that back again at this point. So there's then the common view. So the common view and in RAF parlance, the previous one was the append index or append position. This is the commit 
index or commit position. So this is where we have reached consensus. Now notice even these views are different. So based upon the figures, the leader has determined the consensus is 25. We can safely process 25 and go forward. And it distributes that value to the other nodes. But they're going to be latent. They're behind what's actually going on. One of them's only at 20 and one of them's at 21. So we're kind of aware of what we can be doing and what we can be processing. And then notice the service that's actually doing the logic on this, it's got a different view of the world as well. And so how we coordinate all of these views and go forward becomes an interesting problem when we're dealing with failure. And this is kind of the essence of how do we build systems and do this. Now, we could build these systems where you've got just one value for each node and all communication is synchronous. And that is exactly what the RAF protocol describes. It does work, it is reliable and meets all of the properties. But there's a consequence to that, and the consequence is it's slow and doesn't scale. So there's multiple implementations out there of Raft at the moment. There is only one that I know of that works really well in a wide array network where these nodes are in different data centers and can reach consensus reliably, and that's Aaron. And the reason it does it is because it's purely asynchronous. It is multicasting out the data to be recorded, recording this down in parallel, sending back the positions, and getting a commit position by consensus all in parallel. And that's because you have to accept that the world is asynchronous. It's latent. If, the, if you deal with these with a synchronous view, you get restricted with the throughput and what you can do. Now, arguably, it's a bit harder to do this, but that's a problem for people who develop products to try and be fast enough in this space. What happens when we lose this node? So we happen to lose the leader at some time. We've got to deal with this and go forward. We need to elect a new leader. And we elect the leader based upon which has the most up-to-date view of the world. And that, by up-to-date view, it needs to be has recorded durably to disk that can be recovered in the future. And you'll see that over here, where 25 is the most up-to-date view over 23 here. So even though this one realized the consensus was previously at 21, even though it reached 25, this is the one we must elect to be the leader. And so the leader may be dead. Now, in a real system, it would be really nice if the leader just burst into flames and never came back again. But that's not typically what happens. We often have zombies. And zombies are a nightmare in distributed systems. And generally, the best way to deal with zombies is shoot them in the head. Don't leave them around. <laughs> like, so some of the things, like and I develop systems and things go wrong, I'll just kill the process. And go, That's brutal. Why are you doing that? It's like, if it's a suspected zombie, the best way for the system to try and stay reliable and safe is shoot all the zombies in the head as quickly as you can and go forward. But we do this. And why do we do this? So say, for example, that leader, it didn't burst into flames. It just had a huge GC pause, which is actually often the cause of why things go away. Like we talk about split brain and how networks can get disconnected and be connected again. That is not the common case that you see. The most common case for why we get nodes that end up in a split brain scenario is large GC pauses or other pauses in the system. Because something goes away, you don't hear for it from a period of time, then it comes back. Now imagine this came back claiming I'm still the leader and I'm telling you what to do. You don't want it to be telling you what to do because we have a new leader. And the way we deal with these sorts of scenarios is version everything. So we version the leaderships that have, so we call a leadership term, and we version all the positions along stuff. And so we're always tracking which version are we dealing with? And in this case, is we now have a new term in office, we have a new leader, and the other follower will not respond to the previous leader because they're an old version of that leadership term and just get ignored at that point and kind of move forward. And it keeps it a lot saner and more sensible. So I kind of talked about how this works. It gets a little bit more fascinating than this. So we can have these formally proved models. So RAF's formally proven, PAXOS is formally proven, view stamp replication, 
So we know that they're sound, but can we trust them? And the biggest problem in this space is model fidelity. Now, what do I mean about this? Well, when I said that it can take three to five years to know that a consensus implementation is robust and works well, it's shaking those bugs out. Because by far the most common problem you'll see in these sorts of systems is not the model being flawed, but the implementation of the model being flawed. It's how precise. And so some of this comes down to how well it's described. Like if you read the graph paper and you do it in any detail and implement it, you start realizing it doesn't talk in enough detail about this. And like I'm emailing Diego, this doesn't work in this sort of scenario. Oh, I didn't cover that. Well, did you talk about this properly somewhere? Oh yeah, it's in my PhD thesis. So I go from the 20-page the document to his 96-page PhD. I've got a bit more detail on that. This is great, but actually there's not enough detail in that either. So a lot of these things are often not formal SPACs. And then on top of that, we make mistakes. We're human, we're fallible. We code things up wrongly. We just get things wrong. We haven't had enough coffee one of the days. And from there, we make the mistakes. And we've got to find those and get them right. And this happens to be a common problem across a lot of this, is how we get this robust and working well. And an awful lot of exchanges is getting that fidelity, not just in the infrastructure and how we approach that, but in how we build everything that we do. And it's an interesting challenge in its own right. But one aspect of that is how robust the system is. And when you're building deterministic state machines, because if you've done something on one thread, if it's got a bug in it, it goes to all of the other machines very deterministically. So one of the common ways to take out a cluster is like it's great for hardware dying or operating systems dying. It's not so good for bugs in your own code. So if your application that's running in this has a major bug, that bug is perfectly replicated to every other machine. And then you get an outage. And that's often the case of why people get outages in any sort of clustered system is their own code is the problem. Well, how do we address that? We need to be very strict about all of our inputs and what mutations they're going to cause. So like, go right back to Bertrand Meyer's work on Eiffel. Again, this is not new. We'd be really strict about what are the preconditions before I do something? What are the postconditions after something? What are the invariants that must be preserved? Let's code these up. Like, but what does it mean from a practical level, even simple things that we can do? All the arguments coming into something, check them all. Check all of the ranges before you do any mutation. Do not allow an invalid argument into your system before processing. This is the cause of most of the security bugs as well. We need to be really strict on validating our inputs. Then we go and do any mutation. And make this all up front. Because the worst thing to do is like, do some validation, do some mutation, do some more validation. Uh-oh, I find that this is wrong. I throw an exception. Well, what about my previous mutation? I can't roll that back so easy. It's tricky. All validation comes front, then start doing the mutation, then go forward. This is just good engineering discipline. We've got to get better at some of these sorts of things, and that's what really helps make this much more robust. And particularly, one of my favorite questions to people is like, how well does your application handle errors and error codes? Like, there's loads of really great research in what causes these outages of production systems. Now, the number one cause of outage of production systems is operator error, usually misconfigured or a mistake in command run in production. Like, so part of it is like, no one should have root access in production. No one, even the IS people because you should be just deploying and running complete images and sort of solve a lot of that case and have tested configs that work. But if you're a developer, what should you care about is you've got to care about error codes and exceptions. The really interesting research in this area is that this is by far the largest cause of production outages where people don't check an error code or don't catch exceptions that can happen. And even worse, Many of the exceptions, when they're investigated, there's an exception handler with a to-do in it. Please fix this before we go into production. And hasn't been done. Like, we got to get much better at checking these. Like, I would actually prefer languages to make error handling front and center and just fail if it doesn't work. Like, I tend to set my IDs up that if I've got return codes on something, it is a compilation error if it doesn't check the return code and do the right thing. You're getting into some of those practices and how we should work. Like performance, kind of interesting one. So 10 years ago, 
I think one of the attention grabbing headlines when I first talked about the disruptor and LMAX is we talked about how we could do a million orders per second and keep to one millisecond latency, or 100,000 orders a second at one millisecond latency. That was the thing. And people were like, oh, that's really cool. That's kind of nice. And so just establishing that as a benchmark, because it was interesting, few people would talk about what was possible or how it could be done. Like saying things like we could do it with one millisecond latency, that was an average, which is really not the best way to talk about it. So sometimes we were worse than that, sometimes we were better than that. But that's what we were saying. Like, has things changed in the last 10 years? I kind of wonder, like, where are we now compared to then? Well, are we at least 10 times better? Well, throughput wise, some of the highest volume exchanges are doing a million orders a second. So, yet we've kind of gone forward with that. The latency is more interesting. So, if we were doing sort of about a millisecond for an order back 10 plus years ago, are we about 100 micros now? Well, the best exchanges are down to the low tens of microseconds, so actually significantly better than that. And what's really impressive is how consistent they are in many cases. And this sort of stuff is possible, but it becomes a very different way of looking at the problem space to get good at this, particularly the latency distribution. Right. If I go back 10, 15 years ago, a lot of people used to talk in averages. And Unfortunately, many people are still talking in averages per today, and it's, it just hides too many problems. So averages are a great way to hide stuff and also just sound impressive in some ways. Like Web2 companies are classic for this, the big, the big web companies. We do X billion transactions per day. We actually look at it per second or per millisecond. It's not very high. When you want to look at what is the peak loads in a given millisecond, or 10 microseconds or whatever can get fascinating. So like on exchanges, what happens in the 10 microseconds after market open or the 10 microseconds before market close or just after non-form payroll release? These sorts of scenarios are really fascinating where the load, if you extrapolate it up to a second or more, is really immense and how we deal with that. And once you've got those things, what does that do to the performance and responsiveness of your system? So, the, the big awakening was, do we look at latency as these averages or do we look at them as histograms or percentile distributions as a much better way of looking at this? Because there's various things going on. There's kind of two classifications of problem. There's the systemic events in your system and the queuing events, and they're quite different. So what do I mean by systemic events? This is where a machine has some system-wide event that pauses everything for a period of time. So if you're in the Java world or C-sharp world or whatever, it could be a large GC pause. And often that is not accounted for. So whenever that happens, you're not responding. You're not available. And within that, you've got another interesting thing called coordinated emission. Because what people will tend to say is they'll take the one value that took that period of time. They don't look at all of the events that were arriving during that time period that are also delayed, which really impacts your average as well, and that sort of stuff gets hidden. But these systemic events are much more than GC. There could be pneumo node reclaims. There could be defragmentation happening on an SSD. Many, there could be an SMI interrupt. Various things that are happening on a machine is a vast area on its own. The other side is queuing events. So when you get these bursts of traffic and you've measured over a second, you may look like you've done quite well. But if you measure in the tens of microseconds, you start to realize that actually things queued up and waited a long time before being processed. And this is where things start to really stand out and where the really good systems do well. So if you're into low latency trading, one of the things that do well and win over everybody else is dealing with these bursts very well, and you deal with it by amortizing the costs. So if you need to go to network or disk or do any sort of complex calculation in that time period, you will amortize it over all of the events that are happening at that point in time in your batch. And that way you take down the average cost per item in the batch to be much lower rather than queuing and taking turns. So for example, I need to send 10 orders out very quickly to the network. Do I send out 10? orders and make 10 separate system calls? Or do I fit as many as I can into one network packet and do a single system call? 
and that's how you get to do much better in these sorts of scenarios. So the batching up, you fill the blocks, the disk, you do the filling the packets, the network, all of these things, you amortize and do well in this space. Like garbage collectors have got a lot better. Most people didn't even think which garbage collectors they run 10 years ago, and they didn't change any of the settings. And then we started to realize that parallel old GC had these great big stop the world events. People used CMS. C Sharp had lots of interesting issues in this space as well. And then people discovered things like the Azul uh, C4 collector with a co concurrently compacting collector that would be effectively pauseless in this space. And one of the reasons why that is pauseless and why pauses in GC is a big problem is as we go to higher core counts, these stop the world events factor into Amdahl's law and it means we cannot scale. So if you increase the number of cores, getting all of those threads to be stopped and then restarting them again starts to eat up a lot of time. And that amount of time increases with the number of cores that you have. So you need to do this concurrently and not stop everything. The C4 collector was very good at this because it was designed for the Vega processor. And so going back 15 plus years ago, this was nearly a thousand cores on a single CPU. Incredibly high throughput at these rates. And Amdahl's law was in your face if you didn't get this right. So things had to be concurrent. Now things have moved forward. So like C4 is available, so the Zulu Prime is called these days after being rebranded. But we do have things like ZGC, which is very much inspired by exactly that algorithm, but running further behind in its development. Like it's not generational and that means it's but an order of magnitude less throughput than a generational garbage collector like C4. And then we've got things like Shenandoah, which is doing really well, but particularly for a smaller heap. So they're getting better, and our choices are getting better than what we used to have. Like even G1, which I'm not a huge fan of, has at least gotten much better in the time period that we've got, but it's not truly concurrent. It's just trying to cut the work up into smaller chunks rather than being a truly concurrent garbage collector. And in this space, we have to play with data structures and memory. And this is what's kind of fascinating. So once you've solved all of your sort of infrastructure and dealing with things, to run at very high volumes, you've got to model well and pick the right data structures. And so much of this comes down to cache locality and getting cache misses. Data dependent loads is your biggest enemy in this space. And we can't get through a lot of work if you're constantly cache missing. And what I mean by data dependent load is, if I'm gonna go from a data structure to a, another node or whatever in the data structure, if that's a pointer, we can't tell what's at the other side. So CPUs speculate, they go ahead, they try and do more work, and they can only go so far ahead and then they've got to wait on the previous result because the data that's gonna be returned from the previous result is gonna feed into some later point in the future. So our CPUs are not just totally linear. They're very much running in parallel and they're speculating and running ahead. Now, if you end up needing the previous result, you can't go across that. You can't speculate, you can't guess anymore. And they, for people who are not sure what I mean by speculation, so imagine I've got an if statement and like, if i is greater than seven, do this, else do something else. Well, what you can do is you can assume i is greater than seven, particularly if you've got previous statistics and keep going forward. And if you find out later that i wasn't, you can throw that away and go again. So you can take bets, and often the bets play off, particularly if you've got really good branch prediction. Or even do both branches and throw away the one that's right and, and go with the other one that's wrong. But there's only so far you can go when you don't know the data. Now think of something like a linked list. You go from one node to another. So you go to load a pointer, you go to get the node. If it's not there, you've got to wait on it. You can't go to the next node because you haven't found this one first. So you're data dependent on that. So writing data structures that have good cache locality and can go ahead. And so doing stuff in a res, keeping things in the same cache line, in the same page in the operating system, various things really help with the performance. But to do that, you need a language that allows you to do that. And Java just doesn't. It's so far behind in this space. So at the high end of performance, everyone's going back to C again and Rust. And getting to C. And it's kind of really interesting I've seen so much revival of C and C++ in the last few years that I thought it was going away and it's coming back. And actually the tooling is getting absolutely superb now in this space as well. Now, things like C Sharp's got better, 
but Java is still lagging quite a bit and it's kind of getting there with value types and all, but it's still so imperfect and so little control. But then again, most people store all of their data in JSON and parse it and allocate and every second line in their code is logging, so they don't really care about performance anyway. And like the whole JSON thing, it's just baffling to me. Like the high performance exchanges are all moving to binary codecs. Uh, I got involved with the CME and the move to SBE for that and got uh, part of specifying that and making it work. Like doing sort of tag value pairs and fix is just insane, but we keep doing it. We keep wasting CPU cycles. Like we're having COP26 at the moment, but we're huge contributors to this problem especially all this JSON and YAML and XML and whatnot. Like, I get to profile lots of applications in production and the amount of time we spend going from one format to another format is just staggering. Like, my common game I love to play with customers is find the business logic. So I'll profile the system and find me how many CPUs CPU cycles are spent on your business logic and it usually becomes a game and it's usually way down less than 1% in many cases because the majority of time is going from one format to another format to another format and doing a whole stack of logging in between just to do this. Like we, we got to get much better at this and get more efficient and the way you get your eyes open to this is profile. Run profilers often, know the cost of things like good engineering is knowing about costs and making good trade-offs. Like, if you're going to build a building, if it's only going to be one story high, you don't need to use concrete because you don't need to have that level of compression strength on it. If you're going to build something many stories high, you'll probably choose to use concrete or steel, but then how do you combine them together? Like, you don't just randomly throw it up. You know the compression strength of concrete. You know the torsional strength of steel. You know how they combine. We just don't seem to know any of this in computer science when we're putting stuff together. And yet, to do things well, we've got to get better at that. And then the world has kind of changed. So you kind of look at what happened. So I done my first programming in the early 1980s. I had a ZX81, and I seen machines go forward from that point forward, just getting so much faster. This curve was just really nearly vertical. Like the whole Moore's Law thing, which misunderstood. So Moore's Law is about transistor density, not about performance, but they pretty much go together and things. And so we've seen these like machines getting faster with faster clock speeds, latencies really dropping down, becoming great. Then about the mid 2000s, we sort of had the free lunch over stage and we still got loads of transistors, but clock speeds weren't going up. And they weren't going up because of heat dissipation you run a higher clock speed, you have a cubic effect on the temperature that it needs to run at, and you, eventually you can't dissipate the heat, you can't get rid of the heat, so you can't go faster. So we try to use all of these extra transistors to go faster by doing smart stuff, like speculating for which instructions are gonna be run next and where we're going, and this got really complex. And then we realized we made a whole bunch of mistakes because we would speculate ahead and leave the CPU vulnerable by exposing data from security bugs. We end up trying to fix this by a lot of patches for Spectre and Meltdown as these vulnerabilities were exposed. And so we went from this really steep curve to a curve that went like that to a curve that fell right over. And we got a lot slower around the time when all of this came out. So th this whole thing about things getting faster has become a very different world because of this. And so now we're seeing is greatly increased system calls for going to disk, going to file, and also subtle things like page faults, things paging in, paging out, these sorts of things. There was a really nice obsession with memory map files for a while and using these a lot, but the cost started going up quite significantly around this time period, so we need to think differently about some of this. And what's kind of fascinating is our industry has gone for about four decades of optimizing to preserve bandwidth. And it's kind of inbuilt in our psyche where bandwidth was this limited resource that we tried to deal with and latency so much wasn't an issue. But now we're seeing these leaps forward in bandwidth but no advances in the latency of doing something. In fact, it's starting to go backwards because of Spectre and Meltdown. So it used to be we'd see generation to generation 
increases in clock speed, which meant a direct decrease in latency with how we done stuff. Now that stopped, what we're seeing is bandwidth increase because we're going wider. We're using all of these extra transistors and lanes to go wider. So we're seeing doubling and even orders of magnitude increase in memory bandwidth, disk bandwidth, IO to networks, all of these things. So we need to start programming and thinking differently for that. But it's in the psyche of four decades of previous thinking. And many people don't really realize or think this way. So we've got to be aware of where hardware's going and how it's changing stuff. So the brilliant thing about finance was it improved networking superbly because of low latency trading. Like we have switches with incredibly low latency that are cut through and work really nicely now that we wouldn't have had without high frequency trading. And that's nice and that's benefited the whole world. Disks have been revolutionized in the last decade. So the move to SSDs, like not only are there lower energy, but much higher throughput and getting closer to random profiles that work well. But effectively, all memory access is tape. Like if you access main memory in RAM, if you access it sequentially, it is much faster than accessing it in an arbitrary pattern. You access an SSD with an arbitrary pattern, it's not as fast as going at it sequentially. And what's even worse is like Facebook have published some really nice studies on how when you access SSDs in a more arbitrary pattern, they feel sooner. They actually do better with a much more sequential access pattern. So kind of being aware of some of this. But this improvement has highlighted a really interesting thing. So we now have disks that can do millions of operations per second in parallel. We have network cards that are capable of millions of operations per second. Well, if you're making a system call, and especially with the increase system call overhead because of Spectre and Meltdown patches, we're talking about multiple microseconds to make a system call. That means you can do less than a million operations per second just because of the overhead of system calls. We can't exercise the hardware to get all the benefits from it. Now, people will say, well, if you're looking at Java, we've got Loom, and that can solve some of our problems. It doesn't solve the system call overhead problem. We need to deal with these things as asynchronous. And this is how we use abstractions so wrongly. Our abstractions, like Joe Spolsey talked about how abstractions are leaky. leaky. They're imprecise. Dijkstra says that we are supposed to use abstractions to get a higher level of precision with what we're dealing with. And if we want to deal with these things, they're asynchronous. So our APIs and libraries that deal with them need to be asynchronous. And we see this with network cards, things like VMA access, EFVI type access, IOU ring. IOU ring is now being used for accessing disk as well as network, where we avoid the system call overhead by asynchronously writing our requests into queues that are picked up by the kernel and we get responses back asynchronously in other queues. And this is happening across most other things. So I've been kind of saying for a long time that we really need to embrace that the world is asynchronous and that's how physics work. And we've got to stop treating it as synchronous. I used to joke that synchronous uh, programming, specifically in distributed systems, is like methadone. It's a, people are hooked on this and they just want to keep doing it, but it's really bad for you in many ways. We've got to think about it differently. We've got to have the mechanical sympathy to use these things correctly and understanding how they work. And it doesn't mean that we know the full details of how they work, but we know the basic principles so we use them correctly. It doesn't mean you need to build something, but you need to know how it works enough so to make good use out of it. And then we start thinking about languages. I'm often asked is, which language would I use to program and stuff? And I think the simplest answer to this is whatever the majority of your team is comfortable with. But beyond that, there's some really interesting ways of looking at stuff. Some languages help with productivity. Some are sort of slower to do stuff. But some give you some very different characteristics. Like if you want to be fast right out of the gate, nothing beats C. And it also compiles and runs it all really quickly. It's, it's kind of nice. But things like Java, C Sharp, and other languages, they work quite well. The real standout for me is it's all got very polyglot. 
many systems now have many different languages and how do they interact and how do they communicate across the languages very efficiently and often the messaging with good IPC becomes a big part of this. And kind of wrapping up now with the deployment, like what's changing in this space? Continuous delivery is a very constant problem that we're getting to see happening a lot now. So our constant approach to doing this. And the fundamental to this is feedback cycles. Like why do we want to continuously deliver? Why do we do Agile? It's because we need the feedback, because we don't know all of the answers. The best way to get better at something is to constantly experiment with a really fast feedback cycle that allows us to make informed decisions and move forward. So the faster we can get that feedback is the better. And this is what I find is really fast. So someone who's got like a math background and who's interested in queuing theory and whatnot, when people talk about agile, if they're talking about stand-ups and stuff, they're kind of missing the point. Stand-ups is not the core of agile, it's just a practice. The core of Agile is about feedback cycles. And if you don't understand queuing theory and Little's law, I'd say you really don't understand Agile. Because that's all about what is the impact whenever you're running. So again, who's heard of Kanban? So the whole work in progress, that's Little's law. That's what it's talking about is if you are running at high utilization, you can't take in anything else. Like you don't run a network beyond a certain level of utilization or you get congestion collapse. If you use anything beyond its reasonable capacity, you get queuing effects. And so we've got to think about this. But also, how long is that buffer in that pipe? So if that buffer is really long and it's got queuing effects in it, you don't get a feedback for a long time. So the same things you will do in a system apply in a team. And I find this fascinating because you get people go like, oh, no, you're too low level. Like, you're interested in these deep technical things. I, I do a lot of performance work. I find I can apply exactly the same performance techniques to teams as I can to CPUs because they're all just systems and they all obey the same mathematical principles. It's all the same, and yet we don't respect some of this. It's kind of fascinating how we look at it. We're also seeing a big move to 24-7 operations now across many parts of our industry. Retail customers, they don't understand why things shut up at five o'clock or 11 o'clock at night or whatever. They wanna use their systems at any given time. So we need to be able to do 24 seven. And we need to be able to release at any time. And this is where things like clusters with consensus are much better than the whole primary secondary approach. Like how do you upgrade a primary secondary approach and stay alive? It's not easy. So if you're running a cluster, say you're running a cluster of five nodes, you take one of the nodes out of the cluster, you upgrade it, you bring it back in again. You then pick another node, you upgrade it, you bring it back in again. You go through, you've upgraded all of the nodes in the cluster until you take out the leader, a new leader is elected, and you continue and you keep going. Now we haven't had downtime. We can do hot upgrades. We can do things with feature flags and stuff so we don't turn on those changes until they're rolled out across everyone. And then think about how we version the messages and protocols. And stuff. There's just good discipline to be applied in this area and get it right. And we're seeing a lot more of a move to that. The, the companies that aren't moving to these new principles are just going to be left behind because there's a lot of companies that are doing it and moving forward. And as they do this, you need to be flexible. So you need to be able to scale up and scale down. So like, what do you mean by scale up and scale down? The, the same system that you deploy, can you deploy that system to your laptop for testing or to a production environment to run in a data center with many nodes? It should be the same. And it should be using the same tools because that way you're testing it all the time. You're comfortable with it. It works really well. But that has some implications. Things like hardware load balancers, where do they fit into a world like that? They don't. The world is changing around some of those types of technology. You have to have other techniques that work in this space and work well for that. But we also get a lot of migration and movement of uh, machines and how they work. Ten years ago, people would be running racks of servers and each of them having four or eight CPUs in them. That was your typical sort of server footprint. Some had a few more. Now we can get machines with 256 or even 500 plus CPU cores all in the same box. So you want to be able to migrate your code onto the same box 
or move it apart when you need to. So your communications infrastructure has to be able to do that very transparently. So you don't have to rewrite everything to move things around. And these sort of becomes common approaches that people are taking. So kind of wrapping up, what have we seen over this time? And what do we think about what's going forward? Like, what am I going to see for the next 10 years? So my own observation on the last 10 years has been a very much a move not in the functional space. I hate the term non-functional because it doesn't represent what's going on. Quality attributes is what I mean. And by the qualities of systems, that has been a big focus. Like, how do we really refine our performance when we understand truly what throughput and latency means? How do we understand resilience and tolerating those faults and changes and things? Like, how can we release really often? How can we do all of those things with a quality that really matters? And I think it's a trend that's going to continue. And that will start to permeate through others. I, I get to see this with some systems where people are building with poor engineering practices and they just fail and they go away. And then there's the other companies that are doing it with good engineering practices, with good feedback cycles, can tolerate the changing world and adapting to it because that's what nature shows us. Like Darwin writing about evolution, like the ones that succeed is not the biggest or the strongest, it's the ones that can best cope with change and do it better. And I think this is the way a lot of this is going. And to kind of shamelessly plug some of what I've been working on, like I wish 10 plus years ago something like Aeron existed. I'd built systems like this before, like when we started LMAX, we did everything from scratch. We built our own messaging, we built our own clustering, we built all of our own stuff. And you're spending all of your time doing this rather than actually solving the business problem that you're supposed to be doing. So having infrastructure to do these sort of things. And we just need more of this and actually doing it commonly and getting it out. So like, I'm a big believer in like, some of the stuff is utility and should be done in open source because then it gets better, it gets refined, the quality goes up much higher. But it needs support, it needs help. So like to, feel free to come and contribute, try it. It's there, it's open source. And we offer support on it. So we help people adopt these, help people to think about these type of systems and how to build them better and make use of what's currently there. And on that, I'll let you go and get another beer. And I, but I'll happily take questions if people are interested. So how does a user of a consensus algorithm assess its model fidelity? It's a good question. Obvious things you can do is testing of it. So you can formally prove the algorithm, but that doesn't check the fidelity side. What you can do is start testing for failures and deliberately exercise a lot of the failures through the model itself and fidelity. So a really good test suite is one approach to that. Even better if the test suite is adversarial and done by someone else. So for example, a bit of a call out to Cal Kingsbury's work on Jepson, where he will test other systems and like to, I, I like the approach of where you'll read code, read the documentation, work out how your system works and then test that it does what it does and what it's supposed to do and also based upon a lot of the things that I've seen before. So I think it's, it's, it's an interesting tricky challenge. I think it's similar with concurrency in general from what I've seen. I use a number of techniques, lots of testing is something you can do yourself but we're all flawed as humans. I find one of the best techniques to really increase model fidelity is get things reviewed by other experts in the area that haven't been involved in the implementation because the same people involved will be subject to groupthink and will miss the same problems. So if you know other experts that haven't worked on the implementation, get them to come and review. They find a lot of those sorts of cases. Good independent testers that are good at destructive testing and using things like Jepson. That's one set, and then there's other things like property-based testing. So you describe the properties of the system and throw lots of random events at it, test that the invariants of the system still hold and are true, and there's things like quick check can do that as well. So various tools. So I think it's just a range of techniques. I don't think there's just one answer that solves it. And then ultimately also getting it into production and tested in many different places. And bugs get shaken out through actual usage. So the question is thoughts on microservices in cloud environments? Oh, in a non-cloud environment? 
but not using Kubernetes, not using, yeah, using, oh, using Kubernetes, but not in a cloud environment. Ah, so they were using any sort of microservices. You generally you want to have a relatively slow footprint. That's usually where people are running microservices. They want them to be relatively efficient. I'm guessing that you've got a similar sort of scenario. One of the interesting things is reusing infrastructure. So things like running consensus modules and things to record the disk and various things like that, and especially when you're spinning up multiple microservices, you want to be able to make use of a lot of that infrastructure for running many different services, particularly on the same log or same stream of data to do that. And that amortizes the cost quite a lot. And so the, the way we do that in our own cluster is actually something sponsored by uh, Transfig for doing this. It's a kind of interesting call out is the ability to run multiple services on exactly the same infrastructure and host it, where you're either sharing uh, the same log, so multiple services sharing the same log and being tracked, or multiple services not sharing the same log, but sharing uh, threads and cores for things like a media driver and an archive. And that way, you can make use of that infrastructure. It also increases the startup time to make it uh, lower and makes it faster to start stuff up because all of that infrastructure is already there and going that you're piggybacking off. The likes of the Kubernetes and other things, it creates a whole raft of interesting problems, particularly in how they do networking and DNS. Um, generally, sort of shocked at times where like, there, there's been loads of work through history that's just been ignored and then redeveloped by the lots of the Kubernetes folks and done it all badly compared to what's there before. So like, within Aeron, we spend a lot of time coping with how they do things. Like, for example, as a service starts up, it's going to be in a virtual machine at that point or some sort of container. It's got a name that needs to be registered in DNS. It'll often start the container and then register the name in DNS. So you've got something that's actually running that is not named and not identified, and you've got to deal with these race conditions that should have been another. Or it gets torn down, and straight away the name goes from DNS, and so you get resolution failures, or you move stuff, and you move it, and the IP address has changed, and we have to deal with the resolution. Generally, how they deal with the DNS around this is very painful, but we, we try to cope with it and hide a lot of those things from people who are doing those sorts of issues. Our chances of getting matching engines onto Google Cloud in the next 10 years, I, I know of one already in Google Cloud, and I know of many that are running on AWS. So it's already happening. Some of the loads, it's it. getting the latency throughput is becoming less of a problem. Achieving the really low latency is tricky, but it's getting better. So for example, if you're running Nitro or Metal, there's a lot you can do to get quite predictable latency in that space. The difficult things are how you deal with storage and how you deal with the networking. So for example, you will not use EBS block storage for writing your logs, you will be too slow. But if you've got local SSDs and they're getting better with the choices of that, that gets faster. What's more interesting is the networking side. So typically with networking, you're going through guest to host and either even just doing metal. But a lot of those implementations are not as fast as you will typically get on premise doing your own things. But there's ways around it. So rather than going through the operating system, you can use DPDK to go directly to the Nitro cards. And that will increase your uh, throughput and reduce your latency in that space. And so that's one of the options we actually offer as a premium extension on Aeron, where you can load a different transport binding, and we can go straight to the Nitro card with DPDK to improve that. It's not the same as you're going to get with a solar flare card using the FBI, which we also offer. So that will be lower and uh, lower latency for doing that. But it's getting better all the time. And the likes of Amazon are becoming very aware that this is a space that they would like to service in the future. They have got financial services account teams, and they're actively canvassing to see what is likely to be solutions for the future. Building exchanges with GPUs rather than CPUs. I have seen multiple attempts at FPGAs uh, using EVX and various other things. They often are very limited in what they can do. So GPUs are a kind of odd fit. So GPUs suit 
doing the same thing in parallel, but the same thing in parallel multiple times. So it doesn't fit quite so well. MVX can help in some cases, particularly with some of the data structures that are there. One of the big problems with going to GPU is coming from the CPU across the PCI Express bus to get to the GPU and getting back again. That is quite significant and it has to be worthwhile taking that trip forward and back for what you're going to save. Now, if you've got a massively parallel calculation, risk is a different case. That can fit quite well into that. Whether you put a matching engine in GPU, it may be possible. Maybe I don't know how to do it, but I can't see how that works and does it in a decent way. So what's the use of rust and C adoption? Yes, I am seeing a, quite a, a lot of rust being tried. A lot of it's experimental. Uh, nothing really significant in my own experience so far that I've seen, but I am seeing it in some of the uh, high frequency trading sort of in hedge funds and prop shops. They're running some of their algorithms on that. And it, it seems to be nice. I, I think Rust is a really nice language. The problem with some of the newer technologies is not the language themselves. Like, so it, when you look at these things, it's often the tooling. It's, it's everything around it. It's like, oh, how well did the IDEs work with it? How well did debuggers, profilers, various other things? This is often the thing that holds up and like library support for doing other things. But I think that the models around Rust is lovely. Uh, for, for SBE, there's a really good example of why something like Rust fits very well with certain classes. So SBE requires you to walk through a message in a very predictable order. And it does give you a little bit of flexibility, but if you're not in a really well-defined order, you can get corrupt data for that because it's designed for linear access, which gives you brilliant performance. Now, if you make a mistake, you'll just end up with corrupt data. So you can have good tests and various things to deal with that. You can have code generated that will run a debug build that will verify all of that and then you switch it off in production. But Rust has got a thing called session types. So I don't know if you, for how familiar some people are with some of the advanced type systems. A session type will let, let you specify a protocol of steps that you must follow. And with the Rust SBE codec, you can say that you must access these things in this order. And if you don't, it's a compile time error, not even a run time error. And so you catch some of these things at compile time. It gives you brilliant performance in production, but at an increased compile time cost and whether that gets used elsewhere. So I think the, the sort of uh, memory access model, so things like the borrowing model and session types and other advanced types are really useful, but I don't see a lot of common understanding of it yet in much use. So I think maybe we will evolve to this. I think it would be wonderful to have high performance languages with stronger semantics than C, but I don't think we're quite there yet, especially with the tooling. Thank you all.